If you're close to the money, you know, like an oyster farmer, I eat 100 oysters every week. How many people eat 100 oysters a week? Well, I eat them because they're there. If you're touch, if you're in the business of making money and moving money around and counting money, and it's in the units of trillions, of course you're going to make more money. And then you become so isolated from the real working world of the average person who doesn't have this ability and is struggling to make it to keep his job to pay his mortgage to you know feed his kids and send them to school it's the best part of my job see the white shell the no disease Making a lot of money is like taking a drug. You feel good, head to toe, it's like, it is very similar to a drug. When somebody hands you a million dollar check or a five million dollar check, you want more. Yes, oh, if I'm making five million, I, I, I should be making 50 because I'm a genius. No question in your mind that you are a genius and that the rest of the world owes, you know, you're just so much better than everybody else. A bottle of beer is a pound, but you're having a party, so you need to have a hundred bottles of beer. So how much is a hundred bottles of beer? One bottle is a pound. Tell me, how much is a hundred bottles of beer? A uh, hundred. <sighs> no, 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 no. Paul Wilmot, ook wel de slimste van alle quants genoemd. Wiskundige en auteur van vele handboeken. Een quantguru die al jaren waarschuwt voor het gevaar van een door wiskundigen ingezette ineenstorting van de financiële markten. You go to the shop and you try and buy 100 bottles of beer, you, you may get a discount. They may say okay, you know, for bulk. So one bottle of beer is is 1 pound. 100 bottles is not going to be 100 pounds. It might be 80 pounds. And that's an example of non-linearity. There's a you don't just multiply the 1 by 100. Or it could be that the the, the shop that you're buying the um the beer from, it's late at night, it's the only shop that's open, they know that you need 100 bottles and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we're only allowed to sell one bottle of beer. But if you give me 200 pounds, then okay, you can have 100 bottles. So it might be 80, it might be 200, but it's not going to be 100. And that's, and that's re the, the real world. Um, but that's not in 99.9% .9 of, of finance models. A quant is somebody who uses quantitative techniques, mathematics, statistics, computer science to try to model um, the value of financial securities and how to, how to um, structure them, how to hedge them. Emmanuel Durman, ook wel de Einstein van Wall Street genoemd, was ooit een quant pionier die als theoretisch natuurkundige voor Goldman Sachs ging werken. Nu leidt hij nieuwe quants op aan Columbia University in New York. I, I moved to this field in 1985 when there really weren't a lot of them and it was sort of a free-form business. We were all amateurs. Now you can be a professional quant, but in those days, quant was sort of a derogatory word. It was a bit like geek, sort of, um, which is like, uh, I don't know, uh, slang for sort of computer nerds or computer geeks. There's a lot more respect for quants now in a decade or so ago. They were seen as these very geeky types who didn't really understand the business. Well, they are the business now. 
Manhattan, New York, a beautiful and powerful place where I have a tremendous history and roots, but also a city where money places a heavy hand on daily life, now more than ever. I used to be a computer programmer at a major player on Wall Street that is no longer among us for obvious reasons. I was creating the plumbing of finance. I would write not the models themselves, but the infrastructure surrounding the models. I could do it sleeping. Some of my coworkers were self-satisfied, complacent, with a lazy state of mind. In my better jobs, I got to sit on the trading floor, which was energizing. Most of my career, I sat in a nondescript cubicle form. But I was physically close to the quants, the structurers of CDOs and similar products, the traders. I saw what they were doing, and I felt attracted. They seemed to be solving difficult problems and working at the center of the action. I felt like I was looking in through a window, watching, yet separate. This really made me want to do the job. The pay is good, too. Just as they view the market itself, different employers have different views on these topics. I don't want our agreement or lack of agreement on these issues to be a factor in my job search. That is why I decided to stay off camera and anonymous. One of the first ever equations in finance that I derived is still one of my favorites. Beauty is having the right level of complexity, but not too much. The, the key thing about this is it's a, it looks very simple, but having a, a modulus, an absolute value sign, it makes it, makes it non, what's called non-linear. And that in itself is, is very nice. And one of the problems with, with, um, with finance at the moment is almost all the equations you get are linear, which is boring and not realistic. What financial models do for the most part is ask you for some input, like what will interest rates be in the future, or how volatile will interest rates be in the future, or what will prepayment rates be in the future, and then tell you what something will be worth today or later. And financial models always ask you for some view of the future and then translate that into a price. And so um, they can't predict things in an absolute sense. They can only predict things given your view of the future. And um, people call that prediction, but they're putting the input into there. So in that sense, it's not a correct word, prediction. Yeah, I don't think it's a correct word. And um, people like to say that this great financial crisis, global financial crisis that took place is a consequence of bad models. But I don't think, I mean, there are a lot of things that caused this, but I don't think um, models are by any means the major part. I think it's much more a question of incentives and um, um, yeah, the way the whole system works rather than somebody foolish, uh, foolishly relying. I mean, there are people that foolishly relied on models. Nobody can predict with accuracy how people are going to prepay their mortgages in the future or how many companies are going to default on their bonds. There's always some view that's driving a financial model. Well, my, my models, I wrote a piece of software that you brought in all the elements, the mortgages, what your assumptions about defaults and prepayments were. And so when you achieve that sort of golden moment where everything works, it's, it, it's the numbers are correct, it's easy for the uh, individuals to use, you know, that is a great moment because you, you walk down the aisle, you see all the people using your software, you know, they may not appreciate all the work that went into it, but you know, and you, you, know, you see it working. And then in our case, we were able to sell this software to all the major investment banks in the world. I think we sold one to the AB and AMRO was one of our customers and you know, all the European and uh, Asian banks and the American banks. Mike Osinski worked for 20 years on Wall Street as a programmer of software that slecht the hypotheken versneed tot aantrekkelijke financiële producten. Computerprogramma's waar banken miljarden in stopten en waar biljoenen uitkwamen. But the, but the input into these were all what's called prime mortgages. Mortgages to people that 
to people that had jobs. So they were secure, they were stable, people were making their mortgage payments. It then grew into this vast enterprise in the, you know, I guess, maybe it started to uh, blossom around the early, the late years of Clinton. And that, I, I left in 2000. After that, it just went nuts, you know. They, they were issuing subprime mortgages, a lot of subprime. It was, it was a policy of the government. Both Clinton and Bush agreed that the government should force the banks to issue more subprime mortgages. And of course, the banks were totally in agreement with that because they could, on a subprime deal, they would make a hundred times a profit that they would on a prime mortgage deal. So they were very eager to issue these kinds of debt. Mm -hmm. Now, whether the buyers, the end clients for these bonds, really knew what they were buying is a good question. CDOs actually are a fantastic instrument. Uh, in the way that they take all these mortgages and package them up and then you slice and dice so that you've got each person can take as much or as little risk as you want. Fantastic idea, brilliant idea. If you're going to sell these things, you have to have a really big profit margin because that profit margin, it's, it, may, it may be profit margin, but it also is a margin for error. So it may have a theoretical value of this, but you've got to sell it for this because this covers possible errors. And once people start um, competing with each other, the profit margin shrinks. That's what happens when there's competition. And then suddenly everybody's buying and selling CDOs and it becomes the biggest instrument on, on the planet. And there's no profit margin, there's no margin for error. Combined with quants and quant tools saying, ah, don't worry about it. And then poof. Here I have to um, apologise to, um, to the planet. I don't know, should I apologise to the planet? Um, I, did, I did warn about the dangers in credit derivatives and in mathematical modelling. It is clear that a major rethink is desperately required if the world is to avoid a mathematician-led market meltdown. What you're supposed to do, if you've got a warning, you're supposed to take your warning and write it in book form. You're supposed to write 300 pages about the dangers of etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm a mathematician. And what mathematicians do is they take something that is maybe 300 pages and they try and condense it into one equation. And that to them is beauty. 6.30 a.m. on my way to the library. We'll stay there for the next 12 hours. Today's work, menial computation, abstract manipulation of symbols by hand with a pencil which could add up to another 25 handwritten pages. I like to learn new things, solve really difficult problems. I like the challenge of representing a portion of reality with logical symbols and systems. I must have been 13 years old when I realized that you could calculate the volume of a bowl by breaking it into smaller and smaller rectangles. The flow of crowds. I like to observe the motion of crowds and sense relations and forces that operate upon them. Heavily trafficked public space. Crowds appear and disappear with the rhythm of the daily schedule. I have the ability to see patterns in abstract mathematical symbols. What's the obsession with this particular formula? It, it was the formula that crashed Wall Street. As a mathematician, it's a combination of the sublime and the ridiculous, I'd like to say. Sublime because it's got a lot of beautiful mathematics in there. But ridiculous because ultimately you have to use the thing. So it just relates the probabilities of, of um, defaults happening in two different things to the behavior of two companies kind of independently and then via what's called a correlation. Is it a problem that I don't understand most of what you're trying to explain me? You don't? I don't. Well, we were really dumbing it down, weren't we? Yeah, I did. Oh dear. Suppose you've got um, uh, one of these CDOs and the way the CDO works, you've got, you've got let's say a thousand mortgages 
and all these mortgages are piled into this contract and, and the risk is whatever. The key thing is you've got a thousand different mortgages. And you have to model these thousand different mortgages. And, and within this copula model, there's, a, there's, there's a, an assumption for how these mortgages interact with each other. The relationship between Mrs. Jones' mortgage and Dr. Smith. How many correlations are there in a, a two-by-two two combination of these things? The answer is 1,000 times 999 divided by 2, which is approximately half a million. And how do you know? How do you know what these numbers are, these half a million numbers? You don't. So what the copula boys do is they say, let's assume the numbers are all the same. It's, it's too complicated. Let's just assume the number is 0.6. That's completely ridiculous. You've got a really complicated model there. You've got these complicated interactions between all these people. So that's from the sublime mathematical modeling to the ridiculousness of just saying they're all 0.6. More senior people in banks don't necessarily have a clue what they're doing because all these, these, these quants have all these multiple PhDs and the people above are just you know, management types. Um, they won't understand the, the technical ideas that the, the quants know all about. And that itself can lead to problems because if the quant says, says something, well, what's the manager going to do? The manager just has to believe the quant. Um, and you'll hear stories about, about um, quants basing their models on four or five years' worth of data. And you think, that's not really representative of the, the economic cycles within, within the housing market. And uh, what's that going to do for your, your mathematical models? Of course, anybody who's over a certain age will know that, well, actually, house prices can very easily fall. There was a moment, I remember in 2007, I had a friend in the business socially making a social call and I remember her she said she said the Fed has got to lower interest rates or we're all screwed and I remember thinking I sold all my stocks and bonds you know and I thought geez this is really going to be a lot bigger than people realize if you look around you there's a mortgage on every house there's loans on every car it's a big market your credit cards and if it was failing you know they kept issuing debt people didn't realize People wanted to believe that the, everything was always going to go up. I think they were blinded by the, the amount of compensation that they were getting every year. They're clean. They're clean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, don't bother. I mean, these are huge numbers. To make millions, five million, ten million dollars, that's a lifetime's worth of money you don't ever need to work again, and everybody wanted that. You know, I could quit working this year, I made enough money in one year, I'll never have to work for the rest of my life, and that was the goal of everyone, it appeared to me. Whew. This is money, okay? And Espen's talking about making money, making money, making money, every year you're making money, and then one year, you blow up. Now the difference between this being your money and it being a hedge fund is if this is your money, fantastic, you're making money, you're down here, you're bankrupt. If it is somebody else's money, if it's a hedge fund that does this, every year they're taking a percentage, they're taking some of that as profit, as their bonus, effectively. So they make some of that, they make some more, they make some more. All of this money they're putting into their own bank account. And then, when they lose money, that's their client's money that's lost, it's not their money. So you've got, you, can, you can see why it's, it's very easy for people to abuse this kind of um, thing. I think it's fantastic that people who take risk uh, should be compensated for taking risk. Um, but only if they, they are actually taking risk themselves. Taking risk with other people's money, you should not get compensated for. I'm sorry, I don't, that, um, that, I don't know where that fits into economic theory, but taking risk with other people's money does not get rewarded. Sadly, though, it does in this business. Okay, okay. that's enough for now. What about the white one? There was a moment when I thought, when uh, I questioned why I was ever involved in uh, Wall Street. Get the ice. I need it right now. On the double. Ice. 
that something I thought that people would be more judicious and more conservative in their lending. And I was involved in it, and I thought, well, wait a second, these guys are out of control totally. The piece of software, per se, you know, that's a sort of inanimate object. Yes, people used it, but, you know, if people had used it and put good mortgages into it, it never would have caused a problem at all. But when you put, you know, mortgages that you have a fairly high uh, certainty that people cannot repay, and then half of all the mortgages issued in a given year are that type of mortgages, yes, the industry has gotten out of control. Trillions of dollars a year, basically, went through that model. These bonds, within two and three years of being issued, went from AAA to unrated. I mean, just catastrophic collapse. A lot of trading firms that kept these, uh, the riskier pieces in their portfolio saw them drop to next to nothing. And given the leverages, the amount of leverage and the amount that the banks had borrowed, they were suddenly in a, in a financial panic. Saturday after midnight, still studying. I know long hours will not stop when I enter a future job as a quant. Because I was primarily a technologist, I did not fully understand what was going on. I think part of my motivation post-crash for becoming a quant is to gain that understanding, having been through the personal experience of seeing the destruction of my firm. Looked again at my resume that I put out there. The same headhunter called again today to see if I would like to take a job in my former field as a financial technologist. I declined again, of course. No invitation for a quant job yet. People that are in the business right now probably re refuse to talk to the public. If they were to talk to the press, they would be fired. So only a limited few people in the business have the option of talking to the press. Once you're in the world, right, I mean, your, your phones are ringing, you know, from the moment I woke up in the morning, and I remember, you know, a lot of these guys I knew quite well, and they'd try to wake me up, six o'clock, oh, I thought you were asleep, you know, and you'd be up till 11 o'clock. You have to be wired, you have to be alert every second, you have to be engaged, and, and you, ha you have to be perfect, and you have to be right all the time. You know, the software fails, people lose millions and billions. It can't happen. You can't, be, you can't be wrong. You have to be perfect. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a lot of stress. My wife was in the business with me. We both would wake up in the morning and describe similar nightmares. The phones were ringing and we couldn't answer them. And then we sort of grew out of that and we both realized that we didn't know what day of the week it was. That's Lane Brothers. That is Bloomberg Sports. It's a new Barclays. Barclays. Was leaving. Was leaving. Went under. Hey, Joel. Oysters. Banking has completely lost touch with its purpose, its original purpose, and uh, is, is now becoming dangerous. It used to be that, that when some of these derivatives were first invented, they were to help your know, farmer, for example, hedge the value of his crop. So he, was, he wasn't speculating on the, the price of wheat, he was um, busy growing it. Now there are more people trading these, these commodity derivatives than, than are actually involved in the production of, of the commodity, um, so, which is completely bizarre. I know a lot, quite a lot of people in this business who are feeling a bit um, jaded now. People are starting to ask questions. My, my nice friends are starting to ask questions about their, their role in society. You may be making lots of money, but are you, is it something to, to tell your, your grandchildren? Oh, you know, I, I was a banker. I was there when I, I caused the 2008-2009 uh, the um, crisis, etc. What are they actually doing with their lives? Or, they, or just moving this money around? This isn't necessarily such, such a, a business to be proud of. Mm. 
I think that's probably plenty. 30, 35 pounds. Right. Responsibility is just not a one-way street. When it's successful, you're responsible. Well, you can't be unresponsible when the same, same item is, is a failure. You have to have some type of responsibility. I mean, I could say I wasn't, but I, I was involved. I, I made a, a comfortable, a very comfortable living, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I was proud of what I had done. I, I never, I myself never saw this kind of debacle. Pretty big muscles, you see. They're a little wilder. This is a, you know, they're yellow on the inside. Different color. A chef in the city loves this wild taste. You know? I only do it for one chef because if I did too many, there wouldn't be enough, you know. The modeler's Hippocratic Oath. I will remember that I didn't make the world and it doesn't satisfy my equations. Now that's obviously, that, that's, a, that's about having a, a, a mature uh, appreciation that whatever you do, that the models are never going to be perfect. I will never sacrifice reality for elegance without explaining why I have done so. So it's again, it's a competition between the, the real world and the elegant world of mathematics, and sometimes the real world is just dirty. Nor will I give the people who use my model false comfort about its accuracy. Instead, I will make explicit its assumptions and oversights. Quants are asked the following um, by some trader. They're saying, well, look, you've just measured the risk in this portfolio. Uh-uh, it's too big. Okay, to Quant, back to the drawing board. I want you to redo your numbers and come up with a smaller risk. It doesn't mean change the portfolio. It means change the maths to make it look less risky. People can use the models to hide risk. Though I will use models boldly to estimate value, I will not be overly impressed by mathematics. People make finance too mathematical. So mathematical that many people who have to implement the models don't understand what's going on. And once you have too much mathematics, it's difficult to see where the mistakes are. I understand that my work may have enormous effects on society and the economy, many of them beyond my comprehension. So this is a, a serious business, this is what it's saying. Uh, the, um, the quantitative finance uh, banking has become so enormous, it's, it's outstripped all other, all other businesses. And really, it should just be a service for these other businesses, rather than the, 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 we are, everybody is now working to essentially service the banks, is what it, it feels like. It's, it's completely changed um, the nature of the world, all this banking. Okay. So there's a nice little picture in the, the book of, um, of <laughs> me and Emmanuel Dermott with our, with our Karl Marx beards on, because obviously it's, it's, it's based, it, the inspiration was a kind of um, communist manifesto. You, you take, you combine the Communist Manifesto with the Hippocratic Oath, and this is what you've got. When I first came to the field, I was sort of optimistic about using quantitative methods on the financial markets, and I don't think they're useless, but, um, but uh, I'm trying to think how to say it. I don't think you can use quantitative methods to explain markets either. People like Bohr or Einstein or Schrodinger or Feynman discovered things that um, that seem to be God's truth almost, you know, even if they're, they're not 100% accurate. And um, I don't think that's possible in finance. I sort of think it's an illusion. It, it's, uh, the, world, the financial world and the world of people is changing the whole time. History doesn't repeat itself, whereas in physics, history repeats itself all the time. You can do the same experiment over and over again. So, I don't know, s somewhere, somewhere, somewhere after five or six years in the field, I began to realize that um, it wasn't the same thing as doing physics. In physics, if you wake up in the morning and think of an equation or think of some theory, you actually have a small hope in hell that you might actually be right. But in finance, if you write down some set of assumptions and you look at yourself honestly, it may be useful, but you know it's not going to be right in some absolute sense. Because you're dealing with people and, and people don't work that way. Another weekend, trying to remember all the parts of the city I haven't seen since I started the course. Longing to visit art galleries, eat out every night, to live.
The day at the library seemed to have more hours than the normal 12. Studying alone, with other people doing the same thing, I feel like a monk in a monastery. It's peaceful. The library is quite old. Sometimes we have to cover the air conditioner with old Soviet mathematical journals from the 60s. Once I dreamt of doing pure science, working on rocket ships, working at a small startup company. There has to be a way to be creative as a quant too, like designing new financial products and the math to price them. Do you think it's always possible for people to express a worry they have about the things they're building or writing? It's possible. People may not listen to them in the end. Most of these people are employees. Um, people don't always listen to you. But yeah, it's possible to do it. And I think people should do it. And I think people who use the model should, should understand that. But I don't honestly believe that the models are responsible for, for what happened in the world. I think what's responsible for what happened in the world is that there have been um, an increasing number of... Um, there have been an increasing number of crises since 1990, financial crises in the world since 1994. And every time people are used to, um, people are used to constant growth and acceleration. And every time it slowed down, the government stepped in and tried to stimulate it again by lowering interest rates just like they're doing now. And so you get these sort of a rise and a collapse and then people don't like the collapse so they lend money cheaply and force a rise again and each time the the oscillations get bigger and bigger and they're doing exactly the same i have no idea what's the right thing to do but they're doing exactly the same thing now which is trying to stimulate the economy every time it looks like it stops growing fast it, it shocks me that as a person who runs many businesses that we can talk about an economy um, shrinking by one percent it's awful Growing by 1% is fantastic. It's a difference of 2%. How can that difference of 2% have such a big impact on the world around us? 1% plus or minus in my businesses, I won't notice. The economists, uh, they think that they're scientists. So they come up with these, what they call laws. They're not laws. Uh, laws of gravity, that's a law. Anything that Isaac Newton comes up with it's, is a law. But when an economist comes up, it's just a framework, an idea. It may work, it may not. Sometimes it does. that's not a law. But they think they're laws. And so they build up this whole edifice of theory based upon this very shaky foundations. And they get all sorts of nonsense coming out of it. I think that uh, the natural world is something you learn to appreciate through a struggle. In the financial world, you know, money is a man-made phenomenon, right? It's like a game, right, where you make the rules. Well, money is a, is a game that people make the rules for. But out there, the day-to-day -day activity is not about making money. The day-to-day -day activity is trying to grow an animal, a healthy animal, or a group of healthy animals. That's a big difference. That is beautiful, believe it or not. That is beautiful. Um, the beautiful thing about this is it says that in the risk neutral, now I've got to keep emphasizing, this is the risk neutral version, where mu equals r. If it was the real world, if this was the real version, it would have some demudy t's in it. Now let's do some manipulations. Now some of these manipulations are straightforward. Six over Z, in which case there are no Z's in there at all. If you see what I mean. The D by D big T version, because we want to, we are trying to find the stochastic differential equation, not for log Z, so you're going to end up with mu minus a half, sigma squared, let me backtrack a, a wee bit here. And we have a stochastic differential equation for Z, then we can also write down the stochastic differential equation for f. There was a very, very short period of time when uh,
quants were in the doghouse, so to speak. The people were saying that, oh, yeah, banking has changed forever, quants have, have, have finished, um, there'll be no more of these credit instruments. And I said, you know, hang on a second, guys, you really don't know your history. Uh, you don't know human nature. This will all blow over in a, in a matter of months. And of course, we're, we're back to the big bonuses. Everything goes back um, to, um, to uh, as it was. If people don't complain now, then it, it serves them right when the next financial crisis happens. 12 hours to go before the evening classes start. I feel united with my classmates by the enormous workload. It's actually the fees that we're trying to maximize, right? Of course, we have to maximize returns. We have to do a good job in managing their money, otherwise we're, we're going to do pretty poorly at, at uh, collecting those fees. I wanted to feel challenged again and enrolled in a quants program. It cost me $60,000 tuition, which means more debt that I now have to take on. The incentive fee structure basically means that maximizing the TWR is like maximizing fees. Think about that, that's kind of tricky. This course is a year and a half full time. One and a half years, no salary, expenses living in downtown Manhattan, plus paying full time tuition. So no alcohol for me, not a drop, at least till the end of the first semester. I can't afford to lose a day to a hangover. Hardly any social life for the time being. Most of the other students are Asian or East Europeans. Math is their first language and our common language. We Americans are the minority. Maximizing the number of times that we're going to penetrate the previous high water mark, we're actually maximizing incentive. So you can see that this, this type of optimization is very hedge fund-like. Does everybody get it so far? It used to be the physicists were splitting the atom. Who's splitting the atom these days? Um, building bridges. Who are the people building bridges? Everybody wants to move into this field. The scientific creativity is becoming financial creativity, which is all a bit bogus. Quants are essential to modern banking because so much of it is based upon new techniques like the latest thing is the algorithmic trading, the high frequency trading, uh, for which you need math skills. It used to be, you know, historically you just have like floor traders and brokers, you know, screaming and shouting down on the floor of exchanges and trading stocks, you know, and the order came down and they would run up and they sort of a muscle their way out and wear different colored jackets, you know, the classic pictures we've, we've all seen. Matthew Goldstein, onderzoeksjournalist voor persbureau Reuters, die als een van de eerste de gevolgen van het high frequency trading aankaartte. The reality is so much of this doesn't even take place there. I mean, that's becoming such a, a lesser part of trading and what goes on. It goes on in the back rooms and it goes on in these, these modelings where these programs are put together by, by computer geeks, basically. So high frequency trading is just about taking all this data, analyzing it very, very rapidly, and then putting on trades that may last milliseconds. What worries me the most is um, I was disturbed to hear that some firms get faster access to the markets um, than other people. Um, I forget what they call it now, but people get like a, a, a tenth of a second advantage, big firms, which I think is unfair. Hedge funds try and get the black boxes as close to an exchange as possible, because it takes time for the signal to get from the black box to the exchange to buy or to sell. Now, of course, that is dictated by the speed of light. Now, we're talking about trading at the speed of light. The classic uh, uh, crash was the 87, the 19th of October 1987 crash. That happened within a day. All the, the, the big move, the 20% fall in the S&P 500 was within a day. The next crash could be within minutes. So what is a black box? A black box is just um, something that has, a, it has inside some kind of formula, maybe secret or maybe not, that takes in lots of data. And the data might be stock prices, it might be other information, and it tells you what to trade, what to you know, buy and sell. Uh, and the, my favorite is 
is Google search terms. Trading based on what people are searching for. It's not a black box in the sense that, um, you know, if you, if you saw the algorithms, you could fit well, you, you and me might not be able to figure it out, but, but wiser minds maybe could, and computers can certainly read it. So it's a black box in the sense that it's almost hard for the human mind to, to get their arms or you know, wrap themselves around to really understand what's going on. And uh, you know, people have said for years that Goldman itself is a black box because we don't really know how it makes all this money and the billions of dollars and you know the big bonuses we hear about. The New York Stock Exchange is building this big facility out in New Jersey, which is you know right near New York, and and basically it's being built for high frequency traders so they can have their equipment very close in a very con you know tightly knit factory essentially to do high frequency trading. Well, who gets to have their server where? Is there going to be a lottery? You know. You know, does someone pay more to get closer? I mean, it's sort of a, it's sort of absurd when you think about it. This is what it's come down to. The battleground is ultimately going to be who has the most resources, who can pay the best salaries, the higher the best brains. But in reality, we're talking maybe about a dozen or so really top players. You know, and not everyone can be a customer of Goldman Sachs. Not everyone can be a customer of Morgan Stanley or, you know, Barclays. Um, also, it does the, the high frequency trading means people are more concerned with the price of something and not its value. Value means what it's it's really um, it's really worth. Um, price is just what people buy and sell for. And if you buy something now, sell it a second or two later, all you care about is the price you sold it for is greater than the price you bought it for. Its actual value, who cares? It, it sort of flies in the face of what we sort of think about what, what, the, what the markets are really about. The companies themselves almost don't matter and what they do doesn't matter. It's just the fact which way their stocks move is all that matters. And what's sort of frightening about it that I've seen from the standpoint is the systemic risk that might be involved that so much of this trading just takes automatically and just takes place so quickly that the, the human element gets more and more divorced from it. I mean, the human beings are obviously responsible for, for writing the programs, but there's no human being interstepping between these trades. And we saw this a year ago with United Airlines. There was a false uh, bankruptcy rumor. Some wire service inadvertently had transmitted an old story about a UAL bankruptcy filing. The problem was all these news reading algorithms saw that and immediately started sell, sell, sell. In a matter of minutes, United Airlines stock is cut in half. That is clearly a case where the computers have gone wild. Banking is taking over the entire planet and is having such a major impact on the man in the street. And it really should not. And banking is supposed to be to take money from people with too much to give to people with too little who maybe want to start a business, they've got a business idea, but that, that's not what banking's about anymore. Banking is just about gambling on these, these numbers, not realizing that behind these numbers there are human beings with jobs. There's always been a joke about the New York Stock Exchange becoming a museum at some point, and they'll just have it for like a show there, and people running around. And this is the way we used to trade stocks, you know. And isn't it so quaint and everything? At the same time, one can argue, though, that if if there's this big backlash in high frequency trading we may see revival to some form of human element inside that people may say you know as flawed as human beings are we don't want to give everything over to the machines either just walk past a crowded wall street full of chinese tourists asking me if this was the actual stock exchange wall street as a location is not any longer what it was Many banks moved their front offices uptown and their back offices to newer and cheaper spaces in New Jersey. Now Deutsche Bank is the only major firm left on Wall Street proper. Nearby is Goldman Sachs, with no name on the door, also about to move. There are almost no large firms headquartered in the neighborhood that was the cradle of American finance. Only the New York Stock Exchange remains. Its facade, 
one of the most iconic symbols of global capitalism. I'm always trying to encourage young people to do what I'm doing. I mean, it's a young person's, you know, it's, it's pretty physically intensive. They really haven't grown that much. I may not make it till Christmas here. No, I like a bigger, we sell a much, we typically sell a much bigger oyster, right? What do you find more satisfying? Well, software is a much more um, mental, you know, the, the pleasure and the mental exertion is pretty intense. Like a million lines of software is a lot, to, and you have it all memorized, right? And there's the pleasure of like a scrubble, scrabble, doing that kind of word puzzle kind of thing. Uh, although it's not that healthy. You sit in front of a machine, you have the terminal face effect, you know. It's not the same as this. Oh. You know, this is pretty... Uh, not good. I mean, day like today is pretty idyllic, right? You're just out in the water, a nice feeling bringing food in. So I think we, we sell about 150,000 oysters, which is, uh, that's $100,000. You know, of course, I live off interest, you know. So, I don't, this is nice to have, I make some pocket money, et cetera, et cetera. And the overhead here is pretty small. You have to come to grips with nature, like I, these, these oysters should be bigger. Every year, the ones that I pick in September and October are ready by November. Why they aren't, uh, I don't know, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? Where in software, you can do something about everything. You can modify, you can get, you can create, make, you know, this virtual world, you can make what you want. Here, you know, you have to live constrained by, uh, you know, the real world. <laughs> 